Welcome to the Mitchell Lecture on Sustainability. My name is David Hart. As the director of the Senator George J. Mitchell Center for Sustainability Solutions, I have the good fortune to work with many wonderful colleagues at UMaine and all across this wonderful state. It's also a privilege to belong to a university community led by an individual with an extraordinary commitment to service, unwavering integrity, and genuine humility that makes her a perfect fit for this institution and this state. Please join me in welcoming that outstanding leader, Dr. Susan Hunter. Well, thank you, David. Very gracious uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you to the Mitchell Lecture on Sustainability. This annual event has become a highlight of our academic calendar and speaks volumes about UMaine's dedication to and leadership in addressing sustainability issues. It's always a pleasure to welcome Senator Mitchell to the university, and we're certainly delighted to have him join us for the lecture that bears his name. We greatly appreciate his participation in the lecture, as well as his strong support of the Mitchell Center for Sustainability Solutions and the university in Toto. Tomorrow night, I'll be in Portland, Portland along with about 500 of the Senator's closest friends <laughs> for the Mitchell Scholarship Institute Gala, which is truly an inspiring event. The Mitchell Scholars Program is a remarkable legacy of Senator Mitchell and one that will benefit students from Maine for generations to come. And he deserves enormous credit for creating it. So really, Senator Mitchell. In my long career at this institution, it has been particularly exciting and gratifying to see the increasing role that sustainability research, education, and outreach are, is playing. And the way our faculty and students have helped UMaine become a national and a global leader in this important field. This commitment to university community partnerships, interdisciplinary collaboration, and especially to solutions adds even greater value to the many ways UMaine is working to create a brighter economic, <coughs> social, and environmental future for our state. Central to this institutional commitment is the Mitchell Center's service in providing credible, independent, nonpartisan information to improve decision making for sustainability issues. UMaine's leadership in this realm manifests itself in many forms. At a time when many of the world's greatest universities are finding it difficult to break down the disciplinary silos that stand in the way of collaboration, UMaine's sustainability focus is serving as the connective tissue that engages students and faculty from every UMaine college and empowers the creation of interdisciplinary teams with the expertise to help craft solutions to Maine sustainability challenges. Just as importantly, we're helping to craft and implement innovative solutions right here in Maine, working with tribal communities, municipal planners, the forest products industry, real estate developers, the legislature's environment and natural resources committee, and many others we're an active, valued partner in finding better ways to promote economic and community development while protecting Maine's extraordinary natural heritage. The results of our sustainability research have generated over 300 peer-reviewed journal articles, including those appearing in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and Nature. In addition, a multi-institution, UMaine-led article reflects on five lessons learned in designing and implementing sustainability programs. In the last six years, UMaine sustainability researchers have been awarded more than $50 million in grants from the National Science Foundation, really the gold standard for research excellence in the United States. It is fitting then, after nearly 10 years of Mitchell lectures, to celebrate the many ways that UMaine students and faculty are serving society through their focus on creating a sustainable future. Now it's time to turn the podium back to David to introduce our keynote speaker. So once again, thank you all for joining us. It's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Ruth DeFries to the University of Maine, and especially to do so on this beautiful fall day, so close to one of my favorite rivers, here on the traditional lands of the Penobscot Indian Nation. 
As you'll quickly gather from reading the short bio on the program, Ruth is an extraordinary leader, researcher, uh, educator, and author. As a child growing up in Northern Virginia, she had many interests, including music and animals. But the first Earth Day in 1970 and the environmental movement it helped spawn had a tremendous, uh, tremendously strong influence on the trajectory of her life's work. With land use change as an organizing concept, her pioneering research has brought together such fields as geography, ecology, remote sensing, and conservation to examine interactions between people and nature. For example, she's published many landmark papers demonstrating the complex effects of agriculture on tropical rainforests in South America, Asia, and Africa, including the consequences for biodiversity, climate change, fire, and human settlement. Among her many leadership roles at Columbia University, Ruth is the Denning Family Professor of Sustainable Development. And despite that distinguished title, she would be the first to tell you that the concept of sustainable development is frustratingly hard to pin down. I should add, however, that it's not the only foundational concept that, that resists a simple definition. A few others include justice, health, and peace. Although Ruth's early research often examined the effects of human activities on the environment, much of her current work has increasingly emphasized the well-being of both people and ecosystems. And like the many students, faculty, and partners who work with the Mitchell Center, Ruth has come to the view that it's not enough to focus on identifying the causes of problems at the intersection of society and nature. We now need to help find and implement solutions. At an early stage of her career, Ruth was very fortunate to work with one of the luminaries in the field of sustainable development, Robert Cates, a fellow geographer who went on to co-found the field of sustainability science. Bob was also a major inspiration for the work we do at the Mitchell Center for Sustainability Solutions. And in fact, he helped guide us for five years as the chair of the Science Advisory Board. And he's also UMaine's Presidential Professor of Sustainability Science. I'm delighted to say that he's here with us today. And please help me in recognizing Bob. For the record, Ruth isn't the only outstanding researcher working to advance the science and practice of sustainable development. In fact, three recent Mitchell lecturers, Jane Lubchenco, Bill Clark, and Pam Matson, are also focused on sustainability. But she's unique in her ability to write rich, well-researched, and often lyrical stories for a general audience about the challenges of creating a sustainable world. And if you haven't yet read her wonderful book, The Big Ratchet, I urge you to get a copy. As one small example of the high regard in which she is held, here is what Charles C. Mann, author of the national bestseller 1491, New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus, which is a great book as well, uh, had to say about The Big Ratchet. DeFries shows how our remarkable past can serve as a guide to thinking about our uncertain future. So here is where we are today, and Ruth is the perfect person to help us look back and look forward. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ruth DeFries to deliver the 2016 Mitchell Lecture on Sustainability. Well, thank you, David, for that very generous uh, and kind introduction. And Senator Mitchell, this is just uh, uh, such an honor. To, uh, to be with you here today with such admiration for all of your work, for the environment, for negotiations, for peace. Very much appreciate being here. And to Bob Cates, my mentor, inspiration for however many decades, it's a pleasure to see you after, after quite a while. So thank you. So I want to talk about this space between optimism and pessimism. But before I do that, I want to 
remind us, as we all know, what an incredible planet we live on. There's no other planet like it that we know of so far uh, anywhere in, um, in the universe. This is a planet which is the right distance from the sun, has an electromagnetic field, it has all of these characteristics that make it um, habitable for life. So we live on this amazing, amazing planet and we are an amazing, amazing species. So we often hear about how humanity, humans are destroying the planet, how we're headed for doom, how, how catastrophe is right around the next corner. And certainly there is a lot of concerns in the world about how we are treating our planet. But we are also an extremely innovative and amazing species. So amazing. Let's see if I can make this work. Is this gonna work? Ooh. <laughs> Let's see. Um, we are a species which in our very short tenure on this planet has dominated the world. So it's very difficult to look down on any place on this planet and not see the imprint of humanity in some form, either through fields or through cities or for roads. The whole planet, there was one, here, let me try to go back here. Am I supposed to be aiming at something? Here we go. Uh, so here we are. We've been on this planet for much, for a shorter time than any of our hominid ancestors, and we have managed to dominate the planet. So this is a question that I wanted to explore, not from the perspective of this domination of the planet is ruining the world, or that we're so superior because we have a species that has so cleverly figured out how to dominate the planet, but how did this happen? How did we become the species that is seen everywhere on the planet, unlike any other uh, species that has, uh, has existed. So do we learn something from understanding how we became this amazing species on this amazing planet that helps us in thinking about our future? And the, way I, the lens I take on this is through, um, through thinking about how we figured out how to feed so many people seven billion plus uh, people at this point. And I know from talking to you this morning, from many of the students and faculty, which has been so much fun this morning, uh, that is a topic that we share a great passion for. So if we think about how is it, how is it that we went from just an ordinary kind of species like our ape um, cousins to a species which can produce so much food to produce so to sustain so many people, we are indeed an amazing species. Okay, shall I do that? Next slide, please. <laughs> so, tracing this journey, one of the pivotal steps in how we became such an amazing species was the domestication of agriculture, which began about 12,000 um, years ago. And in many parts around the world. And this domestication of agriculture changed us from being a hunter-gatherer species to, a, uh, to a, a, a farming species and a settled species. Now this uh, um, incredible transformation, which changed the way we are as a species, had both its upsides and its downsides. So the uh, domestication of, of uh, crops, particularly cereals, made it possible to have surplus grains so that there could be settled cities, there could be specialization of tasks, there could be hierarchies of society, um, government structures, and so on. But also came with a raft of problems. Diets became starchier and less diverse. Evidence from two teeth and bones indicates that people became less healthy, people became shorter, 
So diseases such as polio and measles emerged because of the proximity of people living with uh, domestic animals. So a whole lot of problems were created. Probably one of the biggest problems created in that transform pivotal transformation in how we are as a species was in how do we keep crops nourished? How do we keep soils fertile? So with agriculture, the nutrients in the soil go into the crops and those crops are taken away and eaten by us. And if there isn't a way to mimic the natural recycling process of nutrients going back into the soil, the soils become infertile and that's basically the end of civilization because we can't feed ourselves. So humanity has been struggling with this problem that we created starting 12,000 years ago um, ever since in a lot of very innovative kinds of ways. Oops. So much of this story about how innovative we are around overcoming this problem that we created of soil fertility is around nitrogen. And I'm sorry to show you this periodic table, which I'm sure is not what you want to see on a beautiful fall afternoon. But um, nitrogen is so fundamental to civilization in our existence. Nitrogen is in protein, it's in life, it's what cr uh, plants need to grow, it's what we need to eat. Uh, so it's a very important uh, nutrient. So when that gets taken out of the soil, then that has to get replenished. So how did civilization solve this problem of getting this nitrogen and other nutrients back into the soil to keep civilization going, to keep civilization fed? For, um, for centuries, when ancient China was a highly urbanized society and a highly successful civilization, they solved this problem by mimicking nature's recycling process. So the way that they solved this problem was to collect waste, human waste, animal waste, any kind of waste, and carry it back from the towns to the fields. So that was their solution in what's known as, euphemistically known as night soil. You can see that that's what these, um, these people are carrying in the buckets. And that's how Chinese civilization survived, by recycling those wastes from the cities to the towns. And this solution w uh, kept civilization fed in Europe, in New York, in cities where the waste used to be transported and uh, out and used as nutrients on the, on the field. And in some parts of the world, that is still a way of recycling nutrients. But of course, as cities grow and become bigger and bigger, that becomes less and less practical to cart away all of those nutrients. So here we are again with creating a problem that, uh, that is in need of a solution. So then in the, in, the, uh, in the 1800s, the solution, which was a very effective solution at that time, was to take the, the big deposits of, of guano, of basically bird excrement that builds up on the islands off the, uh, off the western coast of South America, and use that as fertilizer, cart that back, to Europe to fertilize the fields. This is all trying to overcome the problem of how do we recycle nutrients to get them back into the field. So this was a, a, a great solution for a couple of decades. It led to a booming economy for Peru. It led to wars and conflicts. Senator Mitchell would have probably been able to resolve it at the time. Um, a resource, this bird excrement, a resource as valuable as oil is today, because that's what was keeping, uh, keeping fields um, fertilized. So this was a solution, again, that the ancient, ancient peoples of South America practiced for a long time, and when the Europeans discovered this solution, uh, was the way that this problem was resolved for many decades. But again, Every solution has a problem, every problem has a solution. So that solution has the problem that the birds weren't replenishing the supplies of this incredibly rich nutrient source uh, rapidly enough to keep up with the pace that that was 
that guano was being mined and carted off to, uh, to Europe. So here we are with the problem again, and there's many other steps in this, this cycle of problems and solutions, but I'll skip to the big one, which was the solution in the early 20th century when Fritz Haber, the German scientist, cracked the problem that there's so much nitrogen in the air, but it needs to be transformed, it needs to be fixed into a form that plants can use. So he figured out how to do that with applying a lot of pressure and a lot of heat, which is what microbes do this in nature for us, but building factories to suck the nitrogen out of the air and transform that into ammonia and forms that then can be used as um, plant nutrients. So Haber is both revered and reviled because he came up with this, uh, this incredible technology that changed the world. It untethered civilization from, uh, from bird guano and human waste and trying to figure out how to keep, uh, keep soils fertile because all you'd need then is a factory to pull the nitrogen out and uh, turn it into fertilizers. He was also um, reviled as a war criminal for, uh, for mustard gas, a very, very tragic uh, story, interesting story of uh, Fritz Haber's life. But he did get a Nobel Prize, and he did, um, did discover this technology or invent this technology that transformed the world. So now, nutrients can be supplied in abundance. And this technology then is what led to uh, the ability to expand agriculture, for industrial agriculture, and about 40% of the world today is, uh, lives off of food that is basically nourished by this, uh, by this process that, uh, that Haber uh, invented also was a, was a solution to how to um, produce explosives. So there's all kinds of interesting anecdotes about how the, the British got a hold of this technology after, after um, World War I and how it spread throughout the world. But um, if you read the book, you'll, you'll, you'll get those anecdotes. But just to make the point that this was an incredibly, incredibly pivotal, world-changing, civilization-changing um, discovery that, uh, that people don't recognize for the transformations that it brought. So what did it bring? It, it was the ability to fertilize soils um, underpinned the incredible increase in food production in the second part of the 20th century, along with genetics, along with uh, fossil fuel mechanization, along with a whole variety of different, um, different ways to Im increase food production. But the increase in food production over the last 50 years has been dramatic. So we all know that the world's population has increased so dramatically. Food production or the production of calories has outpaced the increase in population on a per capita uh, basis. So this is a, whatever you might think of the implications of this incredible abundance, it is a marvel of human ingenuity to be able to produce so much, to be able to manipulate nature to the extent to produce this kind of abundance. But as we see, as we trace these stories, every solution creates another set of problems. And now we live in a time where we're seeing the problems that that solution and having that abundance has created. So one of those problems that, that concerns quite a bit of us, many of us, is the, uh, the inequity in the world between those who have enough food and those who don't have enough food, which is not because there's not enough food in the world, it's because of the malnourished not having access or ability to afford. But gl happily, that number of malnourished people in the world has been declining. It's about 
10% at this point, but it has been on a downward trajectory. On the other side, on an upward trajectory, is the increase in obesity and overweight and all the non-communicable diseases that, uh, that come along with uh, the um, Western diets. And that is a problem that is spreading so rapidly throughout the world and throughout the developing world. So this is not just a developed world problem anymore. This is clearly a, uh, a, a worldwide problem related to westernization of diets, urbanization, and so on. And we also know the uh, problems that these solutions have created through, um, through all of the environmental impacts of producing this much, much food the nitrogen runoff, the, uh, the greenhouse gases, the uh, water pollution, the pesticides, all of these environmental problems which I know many of you uh, think a lot about and um, try to solve. So the point of telling this story is to look at this cycle and we could tell this story about energy, we could tell this story about many other uh, resources. This cycle that we are a very, very clever species. We figure out how to do something which solves the problem at the time, just like domestication of agriculture solved the problem at the time to produce more food and increase population. But then that inevitably leads to some kind of problem which creates another set of solutions. So what I learned from, from, um, from thinking about this was that we are in this endless cycle we're very good at creating problems. We're also very, very good at creating solutions. And those solutions lead to another set of problems. So we are in this cycle. So the, the idea of having some kind of silver bullet solution that solves every problem is probably not, uh, not the way we should be thinking about sustainability, but that we are in this, this endless cycle that we take one step to solve a problem that's going to create some kind of a problem that we hadn't thought about before and we deal with that and we are always just moving forward in this stepwise fashion. We tend to think about some kind of linear progression between, um, between our creativity or our innovations and how much food we produce, but really if we look at it, we see this, this, this cycle. And as I said, we can tell this story for a lot of different resources and a lot of different aspects of sustainability. So where does that leave us? I think it leaves us right now. So we've just been through this, this ratchet. So the, uh, so the terminology here is that we ratchet up something by, by some innovative solution, which leads to some kind of hatchet, which then leads to some pivoting to another, uh, another way of solving that problem, which will then start the cycle all over again. So where are we now? We've just lived through this incredible second half of the 20th century, where we've had this abundance of food produced, uh, an increase in population. We see now where those, the problems that that creates with overabundance, with the environmental problems, uh, social problems, and so on. So we're at that pivot. I see where we are right now as that pivot point. We, we've, we've ratcheted up, we see the problems, and we are now working on the solutions. And I think it's so important for universities. Universities have a great contribution to make in, um, in basic science, which have led to so many advances in so many fields. But also, um, you being a land-grant university, I know think about this very deeply. Also, the social contract that we have as researchers, as the luxury of being able to study um, problems, that we have a social contract to be able to work on these solutions at this particular point in our species history when we are at such a pivotal point and we are looking for the next pivots. Of course those next pivots are going to create more problems, but at this point we know we've ratcheted up so much and our next step is to find those, um, those solutions. So I think, uh, I, I know you here at UMaine think a lot about your social contract, uh, and I, I feel that strongly, that we have quite a, a luxury um, to be in a university environment, and we do have the responsibility to, um, to, to, 
contribute. And I know that you, you, you have that same kind of philosophy in the uh, Mitchell Center, so that's one why it's just so exciting to be here and, and talk with you all today, because you, 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 you're thinking exactly along those lines with the Mitchell Center. So it's been such a pleasure to hear today about the work you're doing at so many scales, at the local main scale, at international work, at all different kinds of levels. So, so I think we share that commitment to, uh, to solution-driven uh, work around sustainability. So how do we think about that? So that's very easy to say. It's very easy for me to stand up here and talk about social contracts and solutions and all of these things. How do we really translate that into what we think about what issues we work on? So I try to think about looking for those, that kind of sweet spot, we're knowing that we're at this pivotal point, that we've been through this ratchet, that we know the hatchet, we know the problems, we need to pivot to different kinds of solutions. How do we even think about what kinds of issues we should address? So we know we have these very, very hard and very big and important and uh, earth system scale issues. And I know we all care deeply about that with climate, with biodiversity, with our global food systems, with trade, all of these big, big issues that loom large in uh, sustainability science. But these are kind of abstract. And to most people, they aren't abstract. How do you really get your, get your hands around these big global issues? So, can we find that intersection? So what most people care about and what policy is mostly directed at, and rightly so, is what affects people on an immediate kind of time scale. Um, human health, people need energy, people need infrastructure, people need water, people need food, the immediate concerns. So I try to think about where do we find this kind of overlap between how we can address what is of, rightly so, of immediate concern, which gets priority, and the big, global, longer term, farther away, more abstract kinds of issues that we know are so important for sustainability. And of course, then, there's also reality, which, uh, relates to political will and implementation and how, how um, things actually get done in the world. So I try to think about where is this kind of sweet spot? Where can we identify the issues where they address a, a, a big global important concern, where they address an immediate concern and have some possibility of uh, reality? And where can we use our science to be able to first identify those kinds of sweet spots and to provide some useful input to addressing them. Of course, science alone is, can't address any problem in totality, but how can we contribute to understanding and um, supporting decisions? So just to run through two quick examples, <laughs> of this in my own work, and this takes us to other parts of the world because my work is, um, is in the tropics. So one aspect of this that one, uh, trying to find this sweet spot, is this issue of um, fires in Southeast Asia. I don't know if any of you are following this issue, but it came to a head last year, uh, about a year ago now when there was a massive, massive haze episode related to fires in Indonesia. Now that happens when there's an El Nino, which is dry in that part of the world, and it's related to land management, forest clearing, human use, uh, different kinds of land uses that leads to this use of fire. So the emissions from these fires blow over from Indonesia to Singapore and throughout the region. And the the um, global change community has been addressing this issue of the fires, and there are also peatlands, deep stores of carbon in that part of the world. So we've been addressing this, this issue of the fires in Southeast Asia from the vantage point of carbon emissions, which they certainly are, 
big carbon emissions and um, black carbon emissions going into the atmosphere, which relates to the global concern of climate change, and it is a contributor. I've been working with a group at Harvard to take another approach to this, that the real immediate concern from these fires, carbon of course is a concern, but is the, is the um, health impact, is that people are breathing this, this smoke coming off of these fires and it has an enormous health impact. If you've been in Singapore, know anyone in that part of the world, you know what I'm talking about, that there is just a blanket of haze when these fires blow over from, uh, from Sumatra in Indonesia into these other parts of the region, not to mention the people who live in those places themselves. So can we find this sweet spot between a global concern, the carbon emissions, and the health impacts of these fires, which are very real? So it's been such a pleasure for me to work with an interdisciplinary group um, of, of atmospheric scientists and public health experts, and we just a few weeks ago put out this paper where we estimated the excess premature deaths from this haze episode in 2015, and it's a very big number, around 100,000 um, excess deaths, and mostly in, of Indonesians, although Singapore is where you hear a lot about this issue, um, not to say it's not important for Singapore. But this, this um, paper just got so much press attention in the region, and also some international papers, New York Times and so on. So much attention in the region, not because we were talking about climate change and carbon, but because we were talking about what affects people directly, health, what they're breathing. And of course, the government didn't particularly appreciate this paper, but I, it's all part of the um, trying to find our role as scientists, to try to find that sweet spot and be helpful in doing credible, reliable, robust analysis that can help towards solutions. Hmm. Oh, Am I going the wrong way? No, going the wrong way. I'll get there. Oh, okay. Um, another example of this is some, uh, a project trying to bring together different world views. So this is a project in India where I work a lot, and one of the many, many, many sustainable sustainability issues is about how do we reconcile the very important need to expand infrastructure in relation to economic growth, so we know in our country with the expansion of highways in the 1950s how important that was for economic development. Well, the same process is happening in India. And roads and rails and uh, power plants and all of this infrastructure is just going in so, so rapidly and the government has a very high priority on economic development. So these roads are being built, I mean, one visit to the, to the next and a, and a new road is built, very, very rapid. So how do we reconcile that with the fact that India is a mega diversity uh, country has the largest population of um, remaining tigers, whose populations are dwindling, has really very um, effective wildlife protection laws, and has some very, very good protected areas, but they're extremely small, very small dots of protected areas, so the large mammals, like tigers, need to move between. So how is a tiger gonna get across a big, multi-lane highway like this. So the conservation community for a long time in India has been opposing this highways, has just been saying no. But we want to step back with this through this wonderful program, Science for Nature and People, which is run by the Nature Conservancy and the Wildlife Conservation Society, to, uh, to take the premise we're not saying no. We know that economic development is important. We know that the expansion of roads is important. but we need to come to some way to allow these iconic species, that the national icon, tigers, to be able to um, have connectivity across the landscape uh, while meeting the needs for economic development. So that brings into play different kinds of stakeholders, the highway authority and different, different ministries which don't think a lot about wildlife. So how do we have this conversation with different stakeholders which might not do not necessarily share our worldview, 
and might not agree with us about the importance of conservation, but if we can come with some options, some solutions, some realistic way of addressing this problem, then we can contribute to, uh, hopefully contribute to uh, meeting the needs for wildlife and meeting the needs for people through economic development. So those were two small examples of just trying to, trying to find this kind of sweet spot and it's always of course a work in progress and I know you all think deeply about the kind of um, work you, you do but just the, the process itself of deciding on what issues we work on, where we, where we devote our talents and energy and resources is, a, is, a, is an issue that needs a lot of thinking in sustainability. And I think we need to move more in the direction of recognizing what people really care about in the short term and will always have priority in the short term, which is these kinds of immediate concerns. So with that, I'd, I'd um, like to thank you, but I'd also like to step back and remember why we do all this. This is a farmer in my study area in India who was telling us about how her, uh, her children are not going to be farmers, how she is the last generation of, of farmers, how that knowledge will not be passed on uh, because her daughter is in college and her son is working in the town. And all of that is wonderful. All of that is a process of development. And we are in a very, very pivotal time because we are, this is, she's telling the story that is millions of people around the world of new opportunities, but also new challenges. How will India produce the amount of food it needs to produce with, uh, with the loss of knowledge from farmers such as this? So we're always in this process. So right now I think we're at an extremely pivotal moment where we, we're looking for solutions and we're looking for the so solutions in a very changing world, in a world where urbanization is happening so rapidly in, in many parts of the developing world, in a world of climate change. So we're, 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 we're chasing this, uh, these solutions, but we're going to always be chasing, not only because the world is always changing, but because the solutions that we come up with will always need, lead to the next set of problems, and then our ingenuity will kick in and lead to the next set of solutions. So I thank you very much and look forward to uh, conversations and questions. So there's time for questions. Uh, maybe I need to use this. Uh, time for questions. And there are a couple microphones moving around. Um, who are the folks? Brady and maybe somebody else? Oh, Tyler, thanks. So I think I saw a hand go up back. It's Frank. Uh, so this space between optimism and pessimism, do you think it's a little biased towards pessimism? And by that I mean, is it harder to develop solutions to problems as we keep ratcheting on? Or is the uh, development of solutions sort of fairly constant? More what, what's your perspective on um, that? I, um I think we're probably the answer is that we're creating problems faster than we previously did, just because the pace of trade, the pace of develop, the pace of the spread of ideas, you know, everything is so much faster. So we're probably creating problems faster than we used to, but we also are creating solutions faster than um, than we used to for the same reasons, because there's such a rapid uh, spread of information, the ability to collaborate. Um, other ways that we can, you know, increase in, in scientific understanding. So I guess we could debate which is going faster, the, the problems or the solutions, but it's not that the problems are just being created without solutions that go along with them. We just finished the third of our presidential debates. The climate change was never even brought up as a moderator or audience question. So our political system seems to be constipated. And I, was just, I just came from a scientific meeting with my colleagues, and climate change got in, came up in the conversations. 
and people don't even want to talk about it really there. So how do we get past this sort of inner dread to take this on and get on with it? Yeah, if climate change is such a hard problem because it's so, if we're solving climate change, we're getting it to the absolute core of modern civilization, which is how do we get our energy? And um, I particularly watch the discussion between the developing world and the developed world, where the developing world, um, rightly so, says that any way to address climate change should not impinge on their opportunity to develop just as we developed in a time when there was no concern about climate change. So that's, that, that discussion has been going on for decades, since the very beginning of climate change negotiations. What is, um, what is a little um, encouraging is that countries did agree to the Paris Accord recently. So the Paris Accord is a very different process. Previously, the negotiations had been about uh, carving up emissions and, and sort of top down, how much does each country need to reduce their emissions. The Paris Accord is a very different process. It's bottom up. It's the countries voluntarily putting on the table what they are willing to, um, willing to commit to able to commit to in terms of their reduction in emissions. So I think we learned from that, I, what I know that many of you appreciate in working in sustainability, that bottom up, um, locally driven, if you think about each country as a local <laughs> entity, um, are more likely to be successful in the long run than top down, command and control, you know, big brother kinds of um, solutions. So that's at the international, you're asking at the domestic level, which, um, I don't know if I even want to go there. <laughs> but, it, you know, these problems, they, will, they are coming to a head, and I, more and more Americans are, um, are appreciating the, um, it, how serious of an issue it is. population the biggest problem that has to be solved? You know, um, the peak of population growth was in the 1970s. So what the demographers project going forward is that population, the global population, will stabilize at nine point something billion at around the middle of this century. So the rate of growth is declining. Of course, there's still a big sort of bunch to push through, so total population is increasing, but the rate of population increase has been declining since the 1970s. And what has been observed around the world over and over again, that population declines and fertility rates decline, again, not with kind of command and control, but when, um, when particularly women have education, have job opportunities, when children are educated, when particularly girls are educated, when uh, people urbanize, then, then there's the desire to have smaller um, families. So the solution to population growth, and of course we still have another billion or so, more than a billion people who will be added to the planet, but if we want to hasten the the decrease in population growth, the way to do that is through giving people opportunities, through education, through, uh, through development. And that's what I think it's been, has been observed over and over around the world in nearly every country, that with development, with opportunities, with education, with jobs, then uh, growth rates decline. I think we'd better stop there. Uh, to thank Ruth for a wonderful, inspiring talk. I want to present her with a mussel shell oh, serving platter. Wonderful. Inspired by the blue mussel, Heather, what species would that be? Thank ah, you. Wonderful. Uh, Thank and you. hand made by artists at Edgecombe Pottery. Oh, so, oh, wonderful. But we'll, uh, don't, uh, 
careful with it. It's breaking. Okay. <laughs> so please join me in thanking. I'm now going to turn the podium over to Travis Blackmer, who will introduce Senator Mitchell. Travis is a lecturer and a program coordinator in the School of Economics. He's the co-leader of a wonderful research team at the Mitchell Center, the Materials and Solid Waste Management Team, and he's also just a delightful colleague. Travis. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm always surprised and flattered whenever I get asked to do anything that involves Senator Mitchell, whether it be at a formal gala where he emphasizes the importance of supporting college education for Maine students, or events like this where the focus is current real world problems. He always delivers a message that resonates deeply with everyone in attendance. In my opinion, as a native Mainer, Senator Mitchell belongs on the 20th century Mount Rushmore for Maine, along with Stephen King, Joan Benoit Samuelson, and a can of Moxie. Moreover, <laughs> Senator Mitchell's inspiring accomplishments and beliefs can be emulated without the need to terrify the general public, run 100 miles a week, or induce a sugar coma. <laughs> Currently, I'm a lecturer for the School of Economics here at UMaine, along with my role as a researcher at the Mitchell Center, which began as my first time job after college. I was fortunate enough to also receive the Mitchell Scholarship upon graduating from high school. Being part of both the Mitchell Center and the Mitchell Scholar Program have been transformative experiences in my life. They've helped me to understand and strive to adopt what I believe to be some of Senator Mitchell's core principles. That no problem is unsolvable, no matter how daunting, that everyone deserves dignity, and that patience and persistence can conquer overwhelming obstacles. My passion for tackling the real world sustainability challenge of materials management requires those three key attributes you embody. In layman's terms, materials management means dealing with all of the excess stuff, garbage, recycling, organics, hazardous materials, etc., that society creates, yet the end user no longer wants. With Senator Mitchell's legacy of determination as a source of inspiration, my colleagues and I are working to develop long term solutions that foster reuse minimize food waste while increasing composting activities and making connections with food insecurity, improve data management, and enhance community involvement in all their material streams. Senator Mitchell throughout his career has been many things, an Army Lieutenant, lawyer, federal judge, United States Senator and Majority Leader, businessman, diplomat, and lastly, one of the most accomplished, accomplished negotiators and mediators of the past century. Last year, Senator Mitchell mentioned how his time negotiating the peace agreement in Northern Ireland, Ireland was 299 days of failure, followed by just one day of success. I take great encouragement from that statement. <laughs> you would not believe how contentious garbage can be. <laughs> to households and communities, it's out of sight, out of mind, as quickly as possible, but never in their backyard. And for businesses, it is their livelihood to manage this resource, and I say resource instead of waste, purposefully for society. That's quite a difference in perspectives. Our research team has strived to be inclusive and responsive to all stakeholders by listening and fostering collaborative efforts. Through this approach, I believe we're making a real difference for Maine's future. A more personal story about the way that Senator Mitchell is perceived by others. Back in 2008, I was awarded the Mitchell Scholarship along with over 100 other graduating high school seniors from Maine. We were in the heat of another presidential election and tensions were high. Not quite this high, but uh, every time, every presidential election is tense. My father is not a man to give false praise, and I doubt that he has ever voted for a Democratic presidential candidate. After I was awarded the Mitchell Scholarship, my father gave the most sincere compliment I've ever heard by saying, I'd trade George Mitchell for any Republican. <laughs> That's an amazing statement and is a perfect example of the public's great admiration for Senator Mitchell's rare ability to unify rather than to divide. To my father and countless others, red, blue, yellow, green, or some other political or apolitical affiliation, Senator Mitchell's commitment to bringing people together despite their differences has made him one of the most widely respected public figures in the world today. Senator Mitchell sees, the, sees needs across the state, better access to college education, hence the Mitchell Scholar Program, hands-on action-oriented solutions to sustainability crises, the Mitchell Center, or even quality primary education as my niece currently attends the George J. Mitchell School in Waterville, and he doesn't just move to solve one problem, he works diligently to solve them all. To end on a personal, I would like to express my gratitude for the contributions you have made to society and to the state of Maine. You truly represent your home state humbly and earnestly with a passion to do good so that all can do well, 
Your distinguished record of public service is an extraordinary example to which all can aspire to, so thank you. It is now my great pleasure to invite Senator George J. Mitchell to the podium. Well, thank you very much, Travis, for that really very generous introduction. Thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for your warm reception and especially for being here today to participate uh, in this lecture series. Uh, Travis was a uh, recipient of a scholarship fund which I created where we give out uh, a scholarship to a graduate from every high school in Maine every year. And uh, I can't tell you how personally gratifying it is to me to see and listen to, talk to people like Travis wherever I go around the state. Uh, over the past few years, there's been a lot of debate, discussion, and some negative talk about Maine and our standing in the world and our education system. But I'll say to you that uh, our kids can compete anywhere in the world. Maine kids are as good as anyone anywhere in the world. Uh, all, all they need, all they need is the opportunity to get the kind of education that will equip them to deal with the problems of the 21st century. Uh, and once they do that, they have the talent and the drive and the energy to do it. And Travis is one example, and I encounter them, not just here in Maine, uh, but all around the country. Uh, I want to thank President Sue Hunter for her unwavering dedication in leading this great university. I've had the pleasure of knowing Sue for many years, uh, and I strongly support her efforts to broaden and improve ed on education here at our university. So please join me in expressing our gratitude to Sue for her leadership. I especially appreciate her strong support for this Center for Sustainability Solutions. Uh, she's been a, a consistent help to me and to those who run the Center led by Dr. David Hart, who's done such a terrific job in organizing and creating this lecture series and almost every aspect of the present functioning and success of the Sustainability Center. So thank you, David, very much, Ruth, and all of the other members of the staff. Ladies and gentlemen, join me. Thank you, again. My mother was an immigrant who came here from Lebanon as a teenager. She couldn't read or write, never went to school, could barely speak English. She worked 50 years on the night shift in textile mills all across central Maine. My father was the orphan son of Irish immigrants. He never knew his parents. Uh, he, his earliest memory was in an orphanage in Boston where he spent several years Ultimately, he was adopted by an elderly, childless couple who settled in Waterville. That's where my mother had gone to follow her sister, who preceded her as an immigrant. And like hundreds, indeed thousands, of other immigrants, they poured into the textile mills of the day. Most of the residents of the area were French immigrants from Quebec, who in the period between the Civil War and the First World War were recruited extensively to come into Maine to provide needed labor in what were then the booming textile and footwear factories in Maine. My father was a janitor. My parents had no money and they lived their entire lives on the edge of failure. And although they died penniless, they regarded themselves as having very successful lives because they achieved their dream. And their dream was that each of their five children would be able to get an education, to go on to college, to graduate from college, and lead lives 
beyond anything they had known. Two of my siblings, one brother and one sister, graduated from the University of Maine. I graduated from Bowdoin, and two brothers graduated from the University of Rhode Island. And so we have, in fact, lived the American dream, and we have, in fact, lead lives, not only beyond what my parents lived, but beyond my parents' imagination. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a story that is repeated in almost every community in our state and all across our country. America is freedom and opportunity. And opportunity means education, knowledge, and skill. And that is why this great university is one of the most important institutions in the life of our state. Because without it, and others like it, people would be doomed to generation after generation of lives of either failure or marginal success and the danger of falling into the abyss. So I always like to come here and I can report to my brother and sister that I spoke at their university, uh, and it's ha I'm happy to be here today. I do speak often. This is the second of three speeches I'll give today. So I've heard myself talk so much. For me, frankly, the introduction is the high part, high point in the program. <laughs> and I have to say that Travis really delivered. Today I'm trying to figure out ways to invite him to my other speeches. Uh, 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 while I'm here this week. It's always wonderful, of course, to hear people say nice things about you, particularly in front of many strangers. But there is also a risk, and the risk is you hear it two or three times a day, you might begin to believe it. And that's dangerous for your mental health. So I always like to begin with a story about introductions and an occasion on which I was brought back down to earth. I spent five years working on the peace process in Northern Ireland. After we got an agreement, I returned to Maine, to my home on Mount Desert Island, and I wrote a book about that experience. When the book was published, I went on a book promotion tour around the country. I received many invitations, and I learned in that process the interesting fact that in the United States, there are more Irish American organizations than there are Irish Americans. <laughs> and every one of them invited me to come. I couldn't go to them all, but I went to many. And as I traveled the country, there developed among these Irish groups uh, an informal competition as to who could give me the longest, most fantastic, frequently, truly ridiculous introduction. <laughs> the proper reaction for me, of course, would have been to show some humility, to ask them to keep it short, I had an improper reaction. I loved it. <laughs> I encouraged them. I scolded them when they left something out. I was in Chicago and a guy spent 30 minutes reading a whole list of everything I'd done in my life. And what was amazing is much of it I had not been aware of until he <laughs> read it off. But when he finished, I scolded him because he left out in my junior year at Waterville High School, I received the science award. <laughs> So by the time I got to the last stop, it was in Stamford, Connecticut. Uh, I was overly impressed with myself. And when I entered, the first person I met was an elderly woman. She rushed up to me, very excited, nervous, shook my hand, began telling me how much she admired me, all the great things I've done. And after several minutes of that, she said, I, I don't live anywhere near here. I drove th three hours all across the state of Connecticut to come here and to thank you. And, tell you how much I admire you and ask you, please, would you autograph my poster? She handed me a poster with a photograph and a pen. I looked at it and I said, be happy to autograph your poster, but before I do, I think there's something I should tell you. She said, what is it? I said, I'm not Henry Kissinger. <laughs> it was a photograph of Henry Kissinger. She said, you're not? Well, who are you anyway? <laughs> and when I told her, she said, why, that's just terrible. She said, I drove three hours to meet a great man named Kissinger, and all I've got is a nobody like you. <laughs> That's why I'm sorry you feel so bad. I wish there's something I could do to make you feel better. And after a moment's pause, she said, well, there is something you can do. I said, what is it? And she leaned forward, and I leaned forward. Our 
forwards were nearly touching, and she said in a conspiratorial whisper, nobody will ever know the difference. <laughs> she, said, she said, would you mind signing Henry Kissinger's name to my poster? So I did. And it's hanging today in her living room wall in eastern Connecticut, a daily reminder of me to uh, Enjoy these nice introductions, but don't take them too seriously. <laughs> well, I want to say that uh, to thank Ruth DeFries for coming here. Uh, we admire your great work. Your reputation preceded you, and we really listen with great interest to your fascinating story, particularly about the ability of humans to feed themselves uh, in sometimes difficult circumstances and the often unpredictable ways in which human beings and nature uh, affect each other. Uh, I especially appreciated her making the point, uh, which uh, I, as a former senator and the majority leader of the Senate for many years, saw actually occur many times. And it is that the solution to every human problem contains within itself the seeds of a new problem. And one of the greatest challenges of political leadership in a democratic society is trying to anticipate not the immediate effect of the action being taken, but the secondary and the tertiary and the further effects down the road. And sometimes it means uh, you either change course or you don't take the solution that is being proposed. And I, I think Ruth clearly was correct in framing this challenge and so many of those as challenges where we have to stop and think before we take an action. And we cannot think of solving human problems as though they were mathematical questions. Two plus two equals four, that's the end of the issue. Life is change. Every person in this room, every human being grows and changes every day and so does every society. And so we have to think of solutions as managing issues that arise. As a former uh, prosecuting attorney, I was the United States Attorney in Maine and a U.S. District Judge, I, I, the example I use is the criminal justice system. Every state in America has a law prohibiting murder. No one thinks that murder is going to end because we have a law prohibiting it. It is atrocious behavior, the violation of not just laws, but all decent standards. And yet we know enough about human nature to know that it is going to continue. And so we do our best to proscribe it, to punish it when it occurs, to try to deter it. But we do not succumb to the view that by passing a law prohibiting it, it will in fact end. And almost all human problems fall into the same category. And I think it, it's very important to be reminded by someone like Ruth of how life is a challenge of ongoing management of problems. And I think we'll, we'll be less frustrated if we think of it that way. Certainly, I wished I'd thought of that more often when I was Senate Majority Leader. <laughs> I want to uh, depart from my past practice here uh, to discuss a few issues that are now being debated nationally and express an opinion on them. Uh, I don't want this to be a, a partisan statement, but you know my views and they will come through in some of my remarks. But I think it's important that we consider a few things and I would like to say them. The first is the issue of that was raised in a question to Ruth of climate change. Uh, I share the disappointment. I don't, don't, I was facing front, so I didn't see who asked the question, or whoever the questioner was, that an issue of such compelling importance was not raised in three presidential debates, even though it affects every human being on Earth, including, of course, every American. And one aspect of it that is deeply disappointing to me. I wrote a book in 1991 about the coming challenge 
from global warming. The title of the book was World on Fire. Then it was largely prospective concern about what might happen in the future. Today, it is real. It is here. And it was especially disappointing that the 17 candidates for the Republican nomination for the President of the United States, without exception, denied the existence of climate change, the warming of the globe to which man-made activities are contributing, and publicly expressed opposition to every measure that has been proposed to deal with the issue, including the Paris Conference, the President's Clean Power Plan, and many others. They must know better. The evidence is overwhelming that the Earth is warming. And in fact, some suggest that ground zero is the southeastern Atlantic coast of the United States, in particular in Miami, where flooding is already occurring with a result, with, as a consequence of that. There was a time when most people on Earth believed that the Earth was flat. There was a time when most people on the Earth believed that the sun revolved around the Earth. Where would we be as a civilization of human beings had science not prevailed and people came to accept the realities that exist, that the Earth revolves around the sun, that the Earth is not flat, and that it's a globe continually both rotating on its axis and orbiting the sun, particularly in the 21st century and beyond, and particularly here as we meet in a great institution of learning, one of the most important institutions in our state, making access to knowledge for all of our young people, those here today and from all across the state. We can't accept the principle that political expediency trumps truth or trumps knowledge or trumps science. We've learned so much from science. Think about how all of our lives are being extended because of the miracles of science that we are learning. Uh, and so I, I hope very much that uh, all of you will at least inform yourselves on the subject of climate change and global warming and will support efforts to deal with it in a responsible way, recognizing that no one person, no one country can solve the problem by itself. It requires cooperative action around the world, but it also requires leadership by the United States. We're very fortunate to be Americans, citizens of a country that, despite its many serious imperfections, remains, in my humble view, still the most open, the most free, the most just society in all of human history. The United States is the world's dominant power and will be for as far into the future as human beings can see. Although we face serious challenges at home and abroad, our military is by far, by far the strongest ever assembled at any place or time in all of history. Our economy remains the largest and the strongest and the one continuing to grow. We are the fastest growing country in population terms of all of the developed countries in the world. Our population will rise from a current 320 million to 440 million in just 36 years in the year 2050. And yet, despite all of this, and much more that I'll mention later about the success of our country, the American people are fearful, they're anxious, and many, many are in protest. On first impression, it seems contradictory, but it is in fact understandable, and the same thing has happened here in our country and in many other countries in the past. The Industrial Revolution was one of the great turning points in human history. It began 250 years ago in England. As machines were invented, to replace men in the manufacture of goods, there was widespread fear over the prospect of high unemployment. There was unrest, there was upheaval, there was violence, there was some exploitation and there was much misery. 
But over the hundred years that the Industrial Revolution continued, there also developed a massive increase in productivity that created new jobs, new services, new economic growth, so that England of that century was the first in all of human history in which although the population rose, so also did the standard of living for the whole society. In other words, it was a discovery that the pie can be made bigger. And that principle spread throughout the Western world and took root most notably in what was then the newly created United States of America, where freedom, where innovation, where new people and new ideas propelled us into the forefront of nations. Today, we and the rest of the world are passing through a revolution that I believe future historians will judge to be as significant as was the Industrial Revolution. It is a revolution in technology and commerce. Its effects, the technological changes are felt everywhere. Every person in this room has at least one cell phone and the pattern and the rhythms of your life have been changed because of that smartphone and your computer and jet travel and electronic communications. And those effects are intensified by the dramatic growth since, since the Second World War of trade across national borders. It began as a peace project. Europe was devastated by three major land wars in 1870, 1914, and 1939. And during the Great War that began in 1939, just after Christmas in 1942, the British government invited a secret delegation of Americans to come to London for non-public talks that were to focus on the great need for reconstruction that would follow the devastation of the war. They had been heartened by the fact that after three years of success militarily and expansion, the Axis powers were checked in three great battles in 1942. Midway in the Pacific, North Africa, and Stalingrad in Russia. The British and American officials overly, were overly optimistic about the prospects that the war would come to a quick end. In fact, it lasted three and a half more years, and most of the 68 million people who died in the war died after their meeting, not before. Their objective was simple. They wanted to establish a series of institutions entangling the nations of the developed world in a series of military, political, and economic alliances to reduce the likelihood of further conflict. They knew from history that trade wars invariably led to real wars. And so they created NATO. They created the European Union, the World Bank, the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, all of them, although they have economic, financial, political, and military bases, are at heart peace projects intended to reduce the likelihood of a third world war. And they have succeeded to a significant degree. Now, imperfectly as again as all human efforts and institutions but we haven't had a world war three and we're not likely to have one in the foreseeable future because of the overwhelming dominance of the united states and its allies now the combination of these two things greater trade advanced technology have like most human actions been both positive and negative there has been, in the last half century, the creation of wealth in the world, and in particular in the United States, to an extent that it, it is without any precedent. But that wealth is not being distributed throughout the economy. 
throughout the whole society, and it's uneven geographically across the country. And so there are many parts of the country that are struggling, while others forge to new heights of success, and many of our fellow citizens are victims, not beneficiaries of the revolution in technology. And neither we nor any other society in the world has yet devised fully effective policies to continue to get the benefits from this revolution while mitigating the adverse effects on the millions of our fellow citizens who are victims of it. That's what's happening in our country today. The grievances are legitimate. The concerns are real. The hurt is there. But we can't let them just wither. We have to help them. We haven't done well at that in our society. We've done well at the innovation. And most of all of this is the result of technological change, innovation in a dynamic economy. There once was in Maine and throughout New England a healthy small industry in which many men were employed in the manufacture of stagecoaches. There is not a single American now employed in the manufacture of stagecoaches because the automobile was invented. No rational person would argue that our country has been is worse off because of that. But the fact is, of course, that the men who lost their jobs, their families, and their communities were hurt. And we didn't do anything to mitigate that hurt. And what can we do? Well, we need a national effort. We need a unity of our people and a unity of purpose. A national effort to make good health, good education, a skill and jobs available to all Americans. That's why this institution is so important. This equips young people to succeed in an era of technological change and commerce around the world. And to do that, we need to recognize that we are more than just a collection of individuals. We're citizens of a free society from which we each derive great benefits and to which each of us owes great responsibilities. Most modern nations are the product of homogeneous groups in race, in language, in religion. But the success of America is different. It's been the work of people from every part of the world, different backgrounds, different religions, different races, committed not to an ethnic entity, not to a particular religion, but committed to an ideal, best expressed by our greatest president, Abraham Lincoln, when he said his object was to form a more perfect union. And it's what's meant by the simple but powerful statement, e pluribus unum, from many, one. Now. We've done it imperfectly, we've done it slowly, we've made huge mistakes, we've made tragic misjudgments along the way, but always in the end, overcoming every challenge, correcting every mistake, and emerging bigger, better, and stronger. Fear and anxiety and harsh responses in times of transition, as we have now, are not new. They are a part of our history. They are a part of our fabric. Even the sources aren't new. So let me talk now a little bit about immigration. For the first century of our country's existence, until 1882, America welcomed immigrants to try to fill a vast continent. The first restrictions on immigration were enacted in 1882. Nowadays, members of Congress have become adept at devising fancy titles to the bills, often misleading, often not only not characterizing what's in the bill, but the opposite of what's in the bill. Back then, they were more blunt. So the first immigration law, the title of it was the Chinese Exclusion Act, and it worked. Angered by the number of Chinese workers who came to help build the transcontinental railroad to connect the Atlantic 
and Pacific Coast of America, Chinese were excluded for nearly a half century. In 1906, a major earthquake devastated San Francisco, and among the many problems facing the city was how to deal with all the school children since most of the school buildings were destroyed. So they hit upon a two-part plan, come up with some temporary structures and reduce the number of students. And they reduced the number of students by passing an ordinance that said any child of Japanese ancestry, even children born in the United States, would be prohibited from entering a public school. That was one response. Even earlier, going way back to the beginning, 500 years ago, when the Spanish, the Dutch, the English, and the French settlers came, they fought one another and the Native Americans for control of North America. And one of their tools was demonization. One of their tools was exclusion. One of their tools was ridicule of those who were different. Everybody here has heard the words Wall Street. What does it mean? Where does it come from? Well, Wall Street's a very small, short, narrow street just above the southern tip of Manhattan. And it marked the northernmost point of the small Dutch colony, which they called New Amsterdam, which acquired Manhattan from the Native Americans. And it was there that the Dutch built a wall to keep out those other that they feared, not the Native Americans, but the English, who had settled in New England and were spreading down across what is now Connecticut into New York. And the Dutch feared that they would be overrun by the larger numbers of English, and they were right, because New Amsterdam is now New York. Well, every successive wave since then of immigrant has encountered hostility. Every Irish American is well aware of the history of the signs being put up all across our major cities, Irish need not apply, and the cartoons that appeared regularly in newspapers and magazines depicting Irish as subhuman. Every Italian American re remembers the guilt by association that because they were among them criminals known as the mafia, they all became identified as criminals. And many people use the word Italian and Mafia interchangeably, even though they were a relatively small number of people. The Ku Klux Klan is best remembered for its violence against African Americans in the South in the 1880s and 90s. But the Ku Klux Klan, in fact, reached its peak in the North in the 1920s, based upon a campaign of virulent hatred to Jews and Catholics. And other than African Americans, no group has suffered discrimination more or longer than have American Jews. And yet, just take a moment to think back over the last 200 years of our history and see the tremendous contributions made to our country by Irish Americans, by Italian Americans, by Asian Americans, by African Americans, by Catholics, and by Jews. The earliest of them, they withstood the hostility, the hatred, the harsh words, and sometimes the violence. They got their hands on the bottom rung of the ladder of American success. And on their backs, the rest of us have moved up the ladder, sometimes to the pinnacle of success. Now, of course, Every American, certainly every reasonable and rational American, knows that we cannot return to the days of open immigration. There are hundreds and hundreds of millions of people around the world who want to come to America. We cannot, in any practical, political, or common sense way, make it possible for them to do so. We necessarily out of our national interest and our national survival, must establish mechanisms to figure out what's the proper number, who should come in, what should be the order, what should be the process.
The problem with the debate now is that it's focused entirely in a negative way. Who can't come in? How can we keep them out? And how can we throw out those who are here not legally? It includes, recently, even a dispute over a religious test. Can we apply a religious test to immigrants? The Constitution appears to explicitly prohibit it. I think we ought to focus on who we want to come, who would add to our society, and surely, surely we, the American people, have the capacity to engage in a serious national debate based on fact, grounded on reason, to establish a sensible policy in immigration that meets our many national interest needs and addresses all of the issues that we do. It has to be a compromise. This is a big country. This is a divided country. No one is going to get their way 100%. But if everyone acts in good faith, we can reach a solution that is a positive solution for most of our country. But as we do so, we should keep in mind that from the very beginning, our country has been enriched by new people, new ideas, new vision. And also keep in mind that every single person in this room and in this country at some point back in history came from somewhere else. Even the Native Americans came across the land bridge of what is now the Bering Sea 15,000 years ago and that the Europeans started coming five and six hundred years ago. And that's true today. Three of the most successful business enterprises in the United States and the world are Apple, Amazon, and Google. Apple was created by Steve Jobs, whose father was born in Syria. Amazon was created by Jeff Bezos, whose adoptive father was born in Cuba. And Google was co-founded by Sergey Brin, who himself was born in Russia. As you drive home today, I ask you to think about two questions. Would we be a better country if they had not been admitted? And what do you think the chances are that if Steve Jobs had lived his life in Damascus, he would have created Apple? Or Jeff Bezos in Havana? Or Sergey Brin in Russia? Genius knows no language, no race, no religion. It can be found wherever there are human beings, but is more likely to flourish where there is freedom, education, and opportunity for all. Now, last night, I spoke in Falmouth, and I said these exact words. And a guy jumped up in the audience, and he said, what about the Nobel Prize winners? I said, what about them? He said, well, Americans have received six Nobel Prizes this year, and every single one of them was an immigrant from somewhere else. Now, I don't even know if that's true, because I just heard it last night. So I say it, that's why I attribute it to him. When I find out it's true, I'll forget the attribution. Uh, now, and, and just a few other things about our country, about despite all the negative talk. We represent 6% of the world's population. And yet, nine of 10 most valuable business brands in the world are American. 15 of the top 20 universities in the world are American. 91% of all online searches done in the world, and 99% of all smartphones are on American-made operating systems. Now, part of our strength, a major reason for our success, is that our strength is based on our ideals. Military power, economic growth are important, but in the United States they have been infused with the ideals that are both the basis and the promise of American life. Not easily summarized, but surely they include the sovereignty of the people, individual liberty, which is our highest value, opportunity for all, an independent judiciary, and the rule of law applied equally to every citizen, and crucially, the rule of law applied to the government itself. 
Our Constitution is more than just a compilation of laws and procedures. It is a statement of our ideals and a symbol of our values, which can be summed up especially in the principles of equal justice and equal rights for every person. Despite all of the negative talk and the drumbeat of tragedy that now so dominates the news, I believe deeply in the American dream, in the promise and the future of America. And I say to you students what I say to my kids who are your age, college age, you're going to live in a much better world than those of us of the 20th century lived in. We've got a lot to be worried about in our country, but we've got a lot more to be thankful for. And I'm convinced that we will emerge from this challenge as we have in the past, better, stronger than ever. And my hope and prayer is that your generation has the wisdom to use that strength to extend education, opportunity, and hope to more and more people here in our country and around the world. Thank you all very much for coming. It's a great pleasure to be here. We've run a little bit long, uh, so uh, I'm going to just close by thanking our two stellar speakers, as well as the co-sponsors of the Mitchell Lecture on the back of the program, a lot of wonderful colleagues around the university, the many students, especially the Mitchell scholars who helped out today, particularly grateful, uh, as uh, Senator Mitchell mentioned, to great colleagues in the Mitchell Center, especially Ruth Hallsworth and Carol Hamill. Without them, none of this could happen. Uh, you're all invited to join us for a reception, which, inspired by Ruth's work, includes a focus on food. Right out there. Thanks. <laughs>